uh, we were shooting ourselves in the foot some, drives got stopped. Um, you know, you're you kicking field goals, man, in a hostile environment versus a good group, man. Um, you know, you're in danger. And so I'm just really appreciative that we're able to get it done. Uh, we got things to work on, uh, but it's really good to, to work on your ills with the W. Everybody, welcome to the Extra Point presented by Microsoft Surface. I am Missy Matthews. The Steelers week one win in Atlanta, 18 to 10. All thanks to Chris Boswell in his field goals. Let's welcome in Mike Pursuta as we dissect uh, this game. Uh, it's week one. A lot of wonky things happen. The Steelers, one of two teams to not score a touchdown, but to win the game. The other was the Bears. And uh, it was a good thing that Chris Boswell was on point yesterday. It was. And uh, it, it was a good thing they were resourceful enough to kind of go with the flow, uh, react to what was happening. Uh, you heard Mike Tomlin a minute ago talk about shooting themselves in the foot early. But they were able to make just enough plays as the game progressed. And uh, maybe my personal favorite, Missy, Chris Boswell punting, Scotty Miller and Ben Skorana gunning. Uh, a 43-yard punt with no return when they really needed a good play in the kicking game. Uh, if you had that, move to the head of the class. Because I know I talked about this matchup many times in advance. I didn't uh, ever mention that as a possibility. That's the way it works sometimes. You, you got to do what you got to do when you got to do it. Right. And as we take a look at the final stats, uh, quickly I'll tell you that Chris Boswell just took off his ball cap, put his mouth guard down, uh, stretched quickly and ran on the field, didn't blink, and came right back over and was looking for exactly where his hat was. I, it was that crazy. And he said after the game, uh, it was good for him, not good for a real punter, but for the Steelers, it definitely worked. But let's good go. Enough. Yes. Let's go all the way back to the very beginning uh, to the opening drive of the game. And this was the Atlanta Falcons with the ball. Kirk Cousins making his Atlanta debut. And uh, Atlanta had some success running the ball on this drive, Missy, uh, which surprised me a little bit. Six carries for 29 yards. That's a 4.8 average per carry. Uh, Steelers tightened that up as, as the game went on. Uh, but uh, Atlanta was uh, able to, to get something established right off the bat. This, I believe, is going to Oh, that's the uh, T.J. Watt play. Uh, there was also a real nice play on this drive by Peyton Wilson, the rookie, making his first uh, appearance for the Steelers. But uh, there you see what happens when you try to single block T.J. Watt on a running play, and uh, Atlanta ends up settling for three. And also, to be fair, Dante Jackson almost had an interception uh, during that drive, but going to the Steelers' first drive in, Justin Fields in his hometown of Atlanta, starting in place of Russell Wilson, who was inactive in the emergency QB yesterday. Yeah, you see uh, fumbled uh, exchange there, and uh, then you see uh, a missed throw here, which uh, could have produced a first down, and then they had to take a timeout because the play clock was running out to get to uh, a nice scramble here by Justin Fields. This was uh, a little bit of foreshadowing by Fields here. This is an element that he has that not a lot of quarterbacks do. Uh, he's able to get himself out of the pocket to extend the play and then realize it was there to be made with his legs, so he made it. And then speaking of making plays with your <laughs> legs or leg, if you will. The first of three 50-plus field goals on the day, um, and it did seem like the offense needed to settle down after that drive. Yeah, and you know, uh, we saw the stats a minute ago, Missy, and no touchdowns in that game, but uh, a good percentage on third down, 47%, which led to a good number of first downs, which led to a good figure in time of possession, and it all added up to be just enough. All right, and it was the first regular season game also for our play-by-play -play guy, Rob King. Let's listen to one of his calls of a splash play. So Cousins in this formation with Robinson now back and all jeer looking to set looking something, to something up. up, goes over the middle of the field. It's intercepted by the Steelers, picked off. And it is Deshaun Elliott who comes up with the interception right around midfield for the Steelers. And this is what you want to see, unsettle the Cousins, right? Get Kirk Cousins kind of a little flabbergasted here, trying to unload that thing and wedge it into an area that he couldn't get it into. Look, there was a whole lot of white around that Falcons uh, receiver there. All right, you love to see when the new guys uh, are starting to make splash plays right off the bat. And also we mentioned Dante Jackson did have another one. We'll get to that. But that splash play did help, and it got the ball back to the Steelers' offense, which they needed to do, Mike. Yeah, and uh, they were able to uh, do something with it. You know, it wasn't an aggressive game plan, 
But that's a pretty aggressive throw there to George Pickens on third down. I think they did a good job uh, in this game, Missy, of protecting the ball, but still picking their spots when to push the envelope, when to put the pedal down just enough. You know, uh, as long as they were uh, maintaining pace, uh, staying within one score, staying tied, maybe playing with uh, a slight lead, uh, they were able to kind of dictate and do things the way they wanted to do them. And then gradually uh, you saw the running game take over. This one, uh, curious to me how uh, nobody saw that take place. At least uh, nobody with a yellow flag. Well, you beat me to it, I was going to say. I think there were quite a few calls that if you were a Steelers fan, you were probably screaming at your TV, uh, wishing that you could speak to uh, the Zebras on the field for that. Also, um, you know, the George Pickens OPI, that seems to be another one that everyone was kind of shaking their head of what was happening there. And prior to that, um, there was a false start. So this really was a drive that started bad, could have been better, and didn't work out. Yeah, that was the uh, OPI there. And again, they're up 6-3 at this point. There's a little bit of a push. By both guys. Uh, you see that all the time, right? I, yeah. I think uh, Greg Olson uh, doing the game as the analyst on Fox, I think he said, we've seen a lot worse. And we have. But uh, it got called. But this was an example, again, of playing with a three-point lead. So now you're willing to take a shot when you get Pickens one-on-one -on -one down the sideline. Uh, Should have worked, but didn't. But uh, you, you, like, you like to see the attempt. This play here, uh, kind of a fluke. T.J. Watt gets to Kirk Cousins and uh, affects the trajectory of the ball and ended up looking more like a short punt than a pass. Maybe that's why Ray Ray McLeod was able to be so <laughs> yeah. comfortable yeah, on the other that. end of it. But, uh, you know, Atlanta got a break there. Uh, made the most of it, and then Atlanta really got a break here because Missy, I don't think this was encroachment. I think this was timed perfectly. And I think, as TJ Watt said, post game to NFL Network, the official went and watched it during the halftime, came back out and said, yeah, I, I, TJ Watt was so livid for many reasons, uh, as we'll continue to get to them, but this is one where he had the tablet and you could tell he wanted to take it out on the field to show them in real time. Kind of like the old Bill Cowher uh, stuff in the Polaroid <laughs> yeah, yes, picture in the, pocket. In, yes. in the official's pocket. Uh, this is the Falcons' only touchdown. Uh, you see they run this wheel route, and uh, the Steelers figured this out eventually. And uh, it all, all was well that, that ended well. But uh, this really impressed me. They got the ball back with 32 seconds left at the 30-yard line. And again, thoughtfully aggressive. Mm -hmm. you, you know, take your shots when you feel they're able to be taken. And rather than just go to the locker room uh, after that Atlanta touchdown, they're able to get down and, and set themselves up for another long distance field goal. And uh, what was it, 10-9 at the break? It was, yep. Pulled within one, and here's what Coach Tomlin had to say about Chris Boswell being, being able to add an extra three before the Steelers went into the locker room at the half. But I'm just really appreciative of how the team supported one another and fought through. Um, and, and that's what teams do. Um, you know, a case in point is we gave up a, a drive there before the half and our offense went down the field and got a field goal to, to respond, and, and, and that was important. All right, so a 10-9 game, uh, and as we saw from both offenses, yes, the Falcons were able to find the end zone, but, Mike, it did feel like after halftime they were able to settle down in terms of the Steelers' offense and control the ball more. But just taking a look at the first half stats, um, I, not great, but it, it could have been worse. Could have been worse. You know, uh, Justin Fields actually hit 11 in a row. He went to the locker room 11 for 13 after missing badly to Van Jefferson and missing badly to Najee Harris. He kind of settled in, mm -hmm. and as he settled in, the offense kind of settled in. Yeah, it could have been a lot worse. They were in a relatively good spot, I thought, after 30 minutes. Well, and I think, you know, no interceptions, not turning the ball over, winning the turnover, uh, you know, battle, that's always key for the Steelers. And then when you get a chance to let the defense do what they want to do. Uh, so let's get into that in the third quarter and picking it up here uh, with Kirk Cousins and uh, TJ Watt saying hi again. Yeah, uh, this was one of the plays that Watt referenced as the, the Steelers fans in the crowd influencing because the Falcons are going on silent count and they're run, running a motion man right into the snap, balls on the ground, and uh, T.J. Watt's pretty good at tracking those things down 
when they start bouncing around like that. Yeah, those three versus TJ trying to get the ball, uh, I don't think there's a problem there. And TJ Watt also motioning for all of Steelers Nation in the crowd uh, to get them route up, and it certainly worked. What did you think? I uh, heard uh, Spencer Anderson, I believe, thought 60-40, 60% Steelers fans. 40% Atlanta, was that accurate? I actually do think that was probably accurate. I think, you know, they sold out for the first time in who knows how many seasons in terms of the Falcons. Exciting, you have new coaching staff, new quarterback, you're hoping for the best. And they were passing out white flags. So it was very evident Ooh. where they were compared to the yellow towels, but I have, uh, they went on the silent count, as you said. TJ's upset again here. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I think a lot of people were upset here. Well, this is another one. I think it could have gone either way. I mean, there's a, that's probably a penalty. Uh, but uh, it doesn't diminish uh, the effort that uh, Watt makes going through two guys, getting to the quarterback, and getting that ball out again. Well, the good thing is uh, Chris Boswell continued to beat Chris Boswell, and we continue to see the connection between Justin Fields and George Pickens, uh, two guys that have known each other since they were in high school. Yeah, and uh, you, you see not only the connection, but Justin Fields hanging in the pocket, taking a pretty good shot just after he delivers the ball. Uh, they found the single coverage, and now uh, they were able to exploit it. And I think that's something, you know, Arthur Smith has said, when they get the matchups they like, they're going to err on the side of being aggressive. Uh, I think we saw that a little bit in this game, and I think we'll see it probably a little bit more as the, the season continues. Yeah, and I think the way that he was using the personnel, a lot of the players on offense talked after the game about how they were doing different things out of the same formation, really confusing the Falcons defense. And only a 40-yard uh, field goal here for Chris Boswell, but uh, again, it still matters at this point in the game. And then we head over to the fourth quarter, and uh, the Steelers were able to uh, do the time of possession thing. Yeah, you, you see the ground game taking over, uh, a lot of uh, two and three tight end sets, and uh, Najee Harris may be playing uh, more impactfully in the fourth quarter than he had in the first three because the Steelers were gradually wearing Atlanta down and out, I thought. Yeah, and the offensive lineman, you know, post game also said you could feel that that was happening and they were all for continuing to run the ball in to help things uh, go in terms of trying to get down there. Yeah, there's see Jalen Warren. I think he only had two carries in the game. Uh, here they are uh, near the goal line. And this didn't work. <laughs> nope. A few things didn't work when they were close to the goal line, unfortunately, for them there. Yeah, this didn't either. Nope. And it was a shame for how close they were and how long that drive was. Uh, but here's what Coach Tomlin had to say about the decision to go for fourth and one after the game. You know, we're going to live that life. Uh, we don't live in our fears, man. We play and play to win. Um, if you can't get fourth and one, man, sometimes you don't deserve to win. And that's just a philosophical approach that we live by. Um, I believe in our bigs. I've talked to you guys repeatedly that we're going to ride the wave that our bigs on offense and defense provide, and we mean it. Obviously, we didn't get it done right there, but we still live that life. Yeah, 13 play drive, 72 yards, had the ball for seven minutes and 14 seconds and came away without points. Now, the option would have been kick the field goal, go up by eight. Now, uh, Atlanta, excuse me, needs a touchdown and a two point conversion just to tie the game. But I think Mike Tomlin sensed there was a chance to actually go for the knockout punch right there. You get that first down, now you're first and goal at the five-yard line or closer, and maybe you punch it in and the ball game's over uh, right at that juncture. So uh, maybe not a decision I would have made, Missy, but certainly not one I'm going to criticize because, again, thoughtfully aggressive. Take your shots when you have them. And then we get to the final drive of the game and where TJ Watt had the knockout punch to end the game. But before we got there, you know, as you said, the Falcons with a chance there and Dante Jackson catching this interception said the first one, he felt like his eyes were just not up enough to be able to grab it. And we saw what happened after this point. Yeah, and as Jackson explained this play, same one he thought that uh, the Falcons scored their touchdown on. Mm -hmm. This time, there's two people uh, covering that wheel route. Uh, it's uh, Ray Ray McLeod, not Pitts, but same concept. And, you know, if Dante Jackson doesn't get that, maybe Beanie Bishop does. So uh, they're in a much look at the pocket just collapsing with the four man pressure. Uh, Mike Tomlin really adamant after the game that they did not want to blitz Kirk Cousins. Uh, that led to this uh, Scotty Miller. Yeah, I was going to say, shout out Scotty <laughs> Miller, who said he found out on Friday he's never held before. Uh, got a few little reps in there, and 
He was called upon and Boz told him, whatever yeah. you do, just do not move the ball. And it worked. Uh, and of there's course, your, there's your explanation take a bow. point. Take, take a, a bow. bow. Absolutely. Uh, and what a way to end it with a walk-off sack for TJ Watt. When you look at his stats because of some of the, the things that were negated due to penalties, uh, four tackles and one sack could have been much better. It's still TJ Watt, and he still impacted that game. Yeah, and he also, you know, one of the tackles was for a loss on a running play that he tracked down from behind. Uh, he was harassing uh, Cousins all game long. Uh, just kind of looked like, I don't know, a defensive player of the year caliber performance. Nothing short of it, and I feel like that's how TJ usually I don't know what rolls. his win rate was on the pass rush, though. I, I don't it, on this program, up. we're not going to run okay. by that. Uh, we're going to go by impact of what he's able to do. Let's take a final look at the defensive stats for the game uh, with the three turnovers. Huge whenever you get a chance to look at that. Yeah, 10 points, you take that every time. Third down, two for nine, you'll take that every time. 226 total net yards, you'll take that every time. Time of possession, it, uh, it all adds up. And that's something I feel like the Steelers were more evenly uh, balanced in the time of possession last year. And when you have a chance to have that significant uh, winning the turnover battle, not turning not turning the ball over, uh, you know, there were a few, the fumbled snap, there were chances where it could have gone wrong, but they were able to persevere. Yeah, uh, the fumbled snap and uh, defensively that first drive, Mike Tomlin not happy they let Atlanta move the ball, but they got, uh, they got them stopped short of the end zone, three instead of seven. Uh, I think all in all for openers, a uh, pretty good, pretty good job in all three phases, and a really good job, particularly with what happened to Cameron Johnston and uh, the punting game changing so dramatically. The Steelers able to adapt on the fly and uh, not let that defeat them. All right, we're going to take a quick break here on the extra point, Mike. We'll get some more of your final thoughts in just a bit. But coming up next, former Steelers outside linebacker Arthur Motes joins the program. Don't go anywhere. Want to get gear direct from the team? Shop all things black and gold at the official Steelers Pro Shop located at Acrosure Stadium. Get the latest sideline apparel and hats, jerseys of your favorite players, authentic memorabilia, custom gear, and exclusives you can only find here. Don't forget, you aren't game day ready without a terrible towel. The Steelers Pro Shop has everything you need to be part of the legendary Steelers Nation. Come experience the Acrosure Stadium shopping environment or shop online at shop.steelers.com. Cousins in the shotgun, gets the snap, looking. T.J. Watt is able to swallow him up. There's a flag downfield. Watt, did he jump off sides? He has a sack for now of Cousins back at about the 23-yard line. He did punch the ball loose. He did come up with a fumble recovery, but he was off sides. It just sucks when you study so hard and find a little nugget, a golden nugget, and uh, you get it. And uh, it gets taken away from you, so that was unfortunate. But uh, it's not going to deter me from continuing to study and making those plays in the future. TJ Watt doing TJ Watt like things. Welcome back to the Extra Point presented by Microsoft Surface. Someone who knows TJ rather well uh, and all things outside linebackers is former Steeler, JMU Hall of Famer, Arthur Motes. Kind enough to join me now. And uh, Arthur, it is very interesting when you hear TJ Watt talking about that golden nugget. What did you make of his performance yesterday? I mean, it was masterful. It was the TJ Watt-like performance. I mean, realistically, we're supposed to be sitting up here right now talking about how he just needs a half a sack to put him over that 100 career sack threshold. That's what we were supposed to be doing right now, but we get it, officiating it, it's, you know, hit or miss at times. But you just live with it. And I think that that was the case in point yesterday for TJ. He's absolutely right. You study all week long looking for anything to give you an advantage. And when you feel like, yeah, I kind of have a beat on when this guy's going to snap the football and you take advantage of it. And when you actually review it, it shows that, yeah, he wasn't offside, that he actually timed it up perfectly. My big issue with that as a whole is just the thought process that for offense alignment, if that's a tackle leaving early, 
it's acceptable. It's considered, oh yeah, he's just getting a jump. You just deal with it. But as soon as the outside linebacker is able to match that, but also do it within the rules, now we're more prone to throw the flag. So that was my big issue with it. But at the end, TJ's talent will always prevail. And that was why he was able to still end up with the game ending sack. Well, and I think also, too, just the amount of bodies that were grabbing at TJ Watt, uh, mugging him, I will say, uh, during the mm -hmm. game. And no calls there. You could see the frustration. But as you said, the walk-off sack, able to do the kick and a bow. That's new. But as he yes. said, first time for everything. <laughs> Uh, the defense as a whole, uh, we know what T.J. Watt's capable of. Some new pieces there. What did you see from them? Man, I thought that the new pieces flew around. Whether we're talking about at the linebacker level, Patrick Queen and Peyton Wilson, I thought that both of those guys were very sideline to sideline, doing a lot of stuff on the perimeter. But then even in the secondary, we saw Dante Jackson leave out of here with the interception. Should have had two of them. Mm -hmm. We saw Deshaun Elliott leave out of here with the interception as well. When you're looking at the ability for the new guys to not just make plays, but to create splash, that's the part, man, in terms of those turnovers that adds to the performance. So to me, man, I thought that defensively our new guys did a great job, but as a whole, they provided the thing that we needed the most, which was minimizing big plays and ultimately giving our offense ample opportunities to move up and down the field. And for the Steelers offense, uh, you know, being able to sustain drives, keeping the defense fresh and off on the sideline. So when they do come in, they can make an impact um, from a defensive perspective. What do you uh, make of Justin Fields first start as a Pittsburgh Steeler? Man, I thought all these considered he did a great job. And why is that? Because 48 hours prior to the game started, he was the backup. He was preparing, but he was preparing for somebody else's plays, right? When we're talking about Russell Wilson, the scheme, the game plan from Arthur Smith was predicated for him. So even though Justin Fields is a professional, even though they both have similarities to their game, it's still a difference when you're talking about something being custom fit for this player. And now I'm trying to on the fly alternate it for this guy. But I thought for Justin Fields, he led six scoring drops. They didn't end in touchdowns, but we still had six scoring drives. We only had one three and out. When we think about just the history of what we've had to deal with offensively these past couple of seasons, that's not always been the case. So to throw in the different variables of offensive linemen being hurt, to throw in Justin Fields not having a full week to prepare as the starter, but to still come out here and have that type of success and let's not lose sight of this the most important part was getting a victory on the road we know how tough it is to win in this league so when i think about all of that i say justin fields did a great job now do we want him to be better of course but for this situation this first test absolutely he passed that and i don't think it hurts you know the steelers offensive guys saying to get that win for arthur smith uh, in Atlanta, he wasn't gloating, he wasn't cheering, just kind of walked off the field. <laughs> but uh, finally, for you, what's one takeaway uh, you saw from an Arthur Smith offense? Man, I thought with Arthur Smith, I loved how he utilized the big athletes that we had. We obviously know Pat Fryman just signed a new contract, but we feel like our tight ends, we feel like our running game is something that we could take advantage of. So you look at how many 12, 13, 14 personnel groupings that were out there, meaning one running back in multiple tight ends, but then his creativity and still being able to spread it out and still on occasion hit George Pickens. I thought that he played into our team's specific strengths and tried to highlight the things that our offensive players did well. Case in point, looking at Justin Fields with some of these run pass options or even getting him on the perimeter where he was able to utilize his legs. These were all things that were very specific to our personnel and I thought was a big reason why we were able to have the success that we did have on Sunday. All right, Arthur, thanks for your time. We really appreciate it. And as promised, Mike Prosciutto will be kind enough to join me once again as we wrap up the extra point presented by Microsoft Surface. Don't go anywhere. Steelers style. Presented by Neighborhood Ford Store, PNC, UPMC, and UPMC Health Plan. Watch our players, coaches, and special guests walk the runway to raise money for Steelers charities. Get your tickets at Steelers.com slash Steelers style. And now it's Boswell back in punt formation. Oh my goodness. Avery Williams standing at his own 37-yard line waiting to receive this boot. 
Snap is good. Boswell will kick it away, and it's a low liner. Avery Williams catches it at his own 40, dropped immediately. Nice special teams tackle by Scotty Miller. Uh, can't say enough about Boz, um, not only in terms of him kicking the ball, but, but that punt um, was timely. And you just saw the blank look on his face. He met business, Triv, and I think it was Cam Hayward last season called him a serial killer in his approach uh, to the kicking game. We saw him punt there, said he hasn't done it since he entered the league with the Texans, and it's not something he usually does. He usually just messes around with it. No, but he, he, he got it done. And uh, the coverage, uh, Mike Tomlin referenced uh, the great coverage by Scotty Miller and whoever that other gunner was. Again, Ben Skoranek, who was activated – the day before, uh, but he has played in the league before uh, with the Rams, and uh, he knew what he was doing. And uh, just that, that kind of resourcefulness goes a long way, Missy. You know, things happen in games. It, it rarely goes according to script. You rarely get through a game where there aren't a couple of curveballs thrown at you that you have to kind of figure something out on the fly and, and get it done. And uh, all good signs that they were able to do that. All right, uh, Mike Tomlin said tomorrow during his press conference, that happens here at noon, he'll talk more about the quarterback situation. Uh, what's your final thought on this one, week one? A uh, couple uh, quick ones here. Uh, defensively, the division of labor. Uh, Landon Roberts started an inside linebacker and uh, played 41% of the defensive snaps. Peyton Wilson, the rookie, played 43. Wilson was in during the nickel. They leaned heavily on the nickel. Uh, a lot of us were speculating that's the way they were going to go based on how uh, Atlanta was expected to do things with three wide receiver sets. I thought that worked really well. And uh, Mike Tomlin citing Justin Fields' demeanor, uh, calling Fields steady, uh, saying Fields is solid as a rock. Uh, he was maybe perfectly suited to go through the kind of goofy circumstances leading up to the game and then working through some troubles in the game and you know outlasting the game if you will uh mike tomlin also talked about uh justin fields having clear eyes missy and uh those of us who are fans of friday night lights know <laughs> clear eyes and full hearts Sorry, yeah. can't lose all right well thanks so much to you trip for joining me here on the extra point presented by microsoft surface and also for arthur motes and his insight as always mike tomlin's press conference tuesday at noon we'll be back here next monday to recap week two